scripture reading today will be coming from Ephesians 1, 15 through 16. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayer. Good morning. What a great crowd we have today, and we appreciate everybody being here to worship God. As you know, we are on a mission. We are on a lesson plan. And that lesson plan is to go through all of the Bible. And up until the last Sunday in October, uh, the Sunday morning lessons are going to be review of the New Testament books. And then the Sunday evening lessons are the review of the Old Testament books. So be back with us tonight as we look at Solomon's book, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, and the Song of Solomon. But today, we're right in the middle of the New Testament where Paul is doing his writings. And you remember, we've already talked about the four Gospels. We already talked about Acts. And at the end of Acts, you know, when it followed Paul's three missionary journeys, uh, after he went on his first missionary journey, he wrote back to those folks, the Galatians. So we talked about that. Then on his second missionary journey, he went over to Corinth, and of course he established the churches in Philippi and Thessalonica, and from Corinth he wrote 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, because he had just established churches there, congregation there. And then we got him on his third missionary journey, got him over into uh, into Corinth, where he's planning to go to Rome. So he sits down on his third missionary journey, and he writes a letter to the Romans, and he tells them, Hey, Romans, I'm coming your way. As soon as I get all this money together that I'm gathering up from the people of Macedonia, that's where Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea are, and the people down here in Achaia, that's where Corinth and Greece is, and Athens, uh, as soon as I get all this money together in the Ephesians, I'm going to go get some money from them and carry it down to Jerusalem and give it to those poor suffering Jewish Christians because they're experiencing a famine. As soon as I get that little work done, I'm going to leave and come to you, Rome, and I'm going to get money from y'all, and I'm going to go on over to Spain. That's what he said in the Romans letter when he was finishing up his third missionary journey. It did not happen that way. It didn't come out. Now, he finally made it to Rome, but it was like two years later, four years later. Why? Because he went to Jerusalem, gave the money, and here is our map. This is is Corinth right here. And he went to Jerusalem, gave the money, and got arrested. Boy, they were going to kill him, going to tear him limb from limb. If it wasn't for Lysias, the chief captain, he would have been killed. But they had some conspiracy. Some Jews got together and said, let's kill him. We won't eat or drink until we kill him. So they had to sneak him out of Jerusalem just to save his life. Where he went to Caesarea and spent two whole years in prison. And finally he got up in front of those uh, prestigious people, Festus and Herod and and then Augustus. And he he appealed to Caesar. I'm a Roman citizen. I want to go to the Supreme Court. And they said, okay. You appeal to Caesar, to Caesar you go. So he got on a ship. Uh, under the guard of a centurion along with a lot of other prisoners. But they went on up to Seleucia. They went over to Cyprus. And they went in this little gulf, not through here because bad weather's coming. Could be a tornado. Could be a hurricane. So they went in protection with the land so the winds wouldn't get them. So they stayed close to the lands. And when they got here, they said, well, uh, we need to spend the winter here because storms are coming. And Paul said, yep, y'all stay here, right in the middle of this, uh, this island here of Crete. So he, they said, no, 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 this is not a good city. We need to go on a little bit further to the east and get a west and get over here on this city. It's, it's a nicer city. We spend the winter in the night. And Paul said, don't you dare get on that boat. We need to stay right where we are. Well, they didn't listen to him. So they got on the boat, and as they tried to just go up the coast to get on this side of the island, a hurricane came. Sucked them right out in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. Spent two whole weeks. Thought they was going to die, but they crashed on the, city, the island of Malta. Paul got snake bit there, uh, but he didn't die. But anyway, after the winter was over, they got in a boat, and they went on up there into Rome, where he is now under, under arrest. He's under house arrest. He's not in the deep, dark dungeon like he's going to be when he writes Second Timothy. We'll get to that later in our lesson plan. But he's under house arrest. Well, he needs money. The government doesn't pay for the 
for the uh, prison system in that day. No. The government, they say, look, you got family, you got friends, you got some way, yeah, th let them pay your way. And if, and if they don't pay your way, you'll starve to death, and that suits us fine. Because we'll just get your body and throw it off in the ditch somewhere, and we don't have to fool with you. Uh, so you better get some, and some meat. Well, Paul had access. He had access to funds because the Church of Christ at Rome was there. Aquila and Priscilla had moved back to Rome. They were in Corinth where Paul worked with them for a year and a half, uh, but they had since moved back to Rome. When he wrote the Roman letter from Corinth, he said, say hello to Aquila and Priscilla. And so he knew people there and they helped him, but he also knew all these other congregations. Folks, these other congregations helped him a lot. And they were blessing him so that he could afford a, a house of some sort and had a Roman guard. He was minimum security anyway. They were, they were shipping him up to uh, the Supreme Court because there was no evidence against him. He had done nothing wrong to the Roman Empire. But, so they put him in minimum security under house arrest with a, a, a guard standing by close all the time. And there he could write letters and he could receive company, and he did. And people would bring him means, people would bring him help, and Paul was just so grateful for all of the help that he had received. We're going to go back one slide, because today we are going to talk about the prison epistles. He's in jail in Rome. He's going to be there for a couple of years. And while he's in jail in Rome, he writes these four letters that we have. Now, he probably wrote a lot more. But God didn't see fit for us to have those letters. Uh, he might have wrote books for all we know. But we do know, as a matter of fact, that he wrote these letters that's preserved in our Bible. And they're preserved for purpose and for reason. And so he wrote the, to the Philippians. He wrote to the, Mr. Philemon. He wrote to the Colossians. And he wrote to the Ephesians. So let's see how that worked out. The first thing that we're going to be talking about is the letter to the Philippians. Philippi is up here in uh, Macedonia. You remember that's where he baptized the Philippian jailer. That's where he baptized Lydia, the seller of purple. He had great, great connections with the church at Philippi. When he left Philippi and went over to Thessalonica, the Philippian church kept funding him. They kept sending him money. When he moved from there and went down to Corinth where he stayed for a couple of years, 18 months, uh, they, he got funded not by the Corinthians. They didn't like him so much. They didn't give him any, he didn't take one thin dime from the Corinthians. Why? Because he knew they would talk bad about him. Oh, he's just preaching for money. Had a lot of factions down there that didn't respect Paul. And a lot of them said, well, I'm not of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas. I'm of Christ. And others said, well, we respect Paul. But uh, he wouldn't take any money from them. Now, he could have, and he, maybe he should have, but he didn't. Uh, he said, I'm not going to do it. Well, how did he get funded? He got a job as a tent maker uh, with Aquila and Priscilla there during that time. And also, the Philippians funded him. They sent him money. Well, the Philippians have heard that he's in jail. They've heard that he's in Roman prison. Oh, that's dangerous because the Caesar is there, and he could have your head cut off just at any minute. So he is, uh, they are scared to death for him. So they get to some funds together. And they send it to him by, by a fellow named Epaphroditus. They send a Mr. Epaphroditus over to Rome from Philippi to bring him these funds in, in his house arrest. And Paul appreciates it so very much. When Epaphroditus gets there, after some time, he gets sick. He gets so sick that he almost dies. And the Philippians hear about that. Oh, Mr. Epaphroditus, he's going to die. He's one of us. Uh, we're so sad about that. So Paul sits down, when Epaphroditus got better, he sits down and he writes the Philippians a thank you letter. Thank you for the funds. But don't worry about me. I'm going to be okay. God is with me. I, I'm prepared to die. I'm, I'm, I'm content. But let me send you back Epaphroditus with this letter so that you can see that he's okay. And as soon as you find out from Philippi that Epaphroditus is okay, then you'll feel better and I'll feel better. Why? Because you feel better. And that's the idea of the Philippian letter. But all throughout the Philippian letter, there's, there's doctrine and there's, and there's things that God wants us to know. So we're just scanning the letter now. So I encourage you, I admonish you to go study that letter verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and see these, 
rich doctrinal truths from God Almighty. But we're scanning the letter to see the content of it. So, here's what we're going to learn from Ephesians, Philippians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Here's what the Bible says. Y'all follow them along. I'm only going to put a few verses up there today on the board so everybody get your Bibles. I'll wait. Get your Bibles. Have Philippians open. We're also going to be looking at Ephesians and Philemon and Colossians. So get ready to look at that. I'll be reading sections of that letter just to help us understand the letter better and put it in context. But I'm going to put up a couple of verses to begin each letter so that you can see the commonality. Paul is in the same place at virtually the same time with the same stuff on his mind. Of course, the Holy Spirit is inspiring him to write this letter of all the doctrine. But when you're in the same place, same place, same time, same circumstances, a lot of the content is going to be very similar. When you lay these four letters together, you cannot help but notice how close they are. And one of the things that's on Paul's mind is captured in his very first chapter, in the very first few verses. He says, I thank my God upon every remembrance. Every time I think of you, I thank God. I always, in every prayer of mine, for you all making requests with joy. Paul is our example for loving and praying for the brethren. Amen? We need, I love Andrew, just a while ago he, he prayed a prayer and he, and he prayed for our brethren. He said, be with Chandler, you know, be with Jeff Martin, be, be with the folk, be, be with uh, Mr. Sarton, James Esther Sarton in his recovery. He prayed for the brethren. Why? Because he loved the brethren. And he, and, he, and he led our minds into that prayer so that we are, by name, praying for the brethren. We ought to be thankful to God every time we remember our brethren. Here's what I'm afraid of happens oftentimes. We remember our brethren and we ain't thankful at all. As a matter of fact, we're upset. We're mad at them. We hate them. We wish that we, they wish they weren't our brethren. Uh, we, we should follow Paul's example. To every, he says, I thank God every time I think of you. I thank God. I think about y'all when I was in my second missionary journey and baptized the Philippian jailer. I think about God. And, and then, then I thank him. Think and thank. I, if I didn't speak country, I thank God. I think about it. I think about it. Every time I think about you, I stop and thank God. Is it true that every time I think about a brother and sister in Christ, I stop and give thanks to God for them? That's what Paul did. He said, in every single prayer, every prayer of mine, I think about you guys and I thank God for you. And I make requests for you with joy. I request that you be healed. I request that you grow. I request that you remain faithful. He's going to say this now in every one of these four letters that he's writing. And he's in prison. They are free. Can you imagine? Usually, the person who's free is the one who is thankful and full of joy. Not Paul. Even though I'm in prison, I'm thankful. And I pray and I make requests with joy. Even though I'm in prison. So we certainly need to follow Paul's example to be thankful for our brethren and pray for them. Look at Philippians chapter 1. You're there. Look at verse number 12. He said, but I would you understand something, brethren, what? That the things which happened to me, being in jail in Caesarea for two years, and then uh, shot up here for the next two years, he said, all these things happened unto me and fell out rather for the furtherance of the gospel. I could not have done what I've been able to do free like I'm able to do it now. He is in a Roman prison, and you know who he gets to talk to? the servants, the slaves of the household of Caesar, the family of Caesar himself. And these slaves are obeying the gospel. Paul's preaching to them every day. And they're taking that message, that truth, and they are converted. And they're going into the very political basis 
maybe not Caesar himself, but his entourage and maybe his subjects and, and the people with great influence, they are becoming Christians. And Paul said, I couldn't have furthered the gospel on my own like this. These things have happened to me for the furtherance of the gospel. I was just going to come here, say hello, get some money and go to Spain. I think ultimately he will go to Spain, but at this juncture, he's doing the work of God. And even Caesar's household is learning the truth. He goes on to say, Nevertheless, uh, or rather, they fall unto me, he says, So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. So even the palace is getting the gospel. Look down in verse number 23 of chapter 1. Now, folks, I know you worried about me. And I know that you sent me this money to help me. And I appreciate it. I'm thanking you for it. And I know that you're losing sleep at night because you're worried about me getting killed by Caesar. Well, actually, let me tell you something. I am in a strait between two. That means I'm in a, I'm in a position. I'm, I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place. I got a hard place. What is it? I have a desire to depart and to be with Christ. I want to die. It'd be okay for me to go on and be with Christ. It's far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. So staying here, alive, I can help you guys. But having this confidence, I know that I shall abide. I believe I'm going to live. So don't you and Philippi worry about me. I'm going to continue with you all for furtherance of joy of your faith. I'm going to be able to, uh, to stick around a while. That your rejoicing, you Philippians rejoicing, may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming again to you. I expect that soon I'll be let out of prison and I, I'll make a, a plan to come visit you. Oh, that's so good news. The Philippians reading this for the first time said, Whew, boy, I feel better that Paul uh, has that idea that he's going to get out of jail. Look at chapter 2, verse number 19. Chapter 2, verse number 19. I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy shortly unto you. Chapter 2, verse 19. I'm going to send Timothy to you. Why? That I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. See, I love you too. I care about you. I pray for you. And when Timothy brings, comes and sees you, he'll come back to me and tell me how you're doing. And that'll make me feel good. They don't have Facebook. They can't call each other. or send. No, they have to send couriers. So I'll send Timothy 4, verse number 20. I have no man like-minded, nobody like Timothy, who will naturally care for your state. He loves you guys too. He was with them in that second missionary journey when they baptized the Philippian jailer. For all, verse number 21, all seek their own. Everybody's looking for their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. Everybody's looking to value themselves and, and grow themselves. But you know the proof of Timothy, of him, that as a son with a father, he has served me with the gospel. He's like my son, and I trust him. He goes on to say in verse 22, But you know the proof of him, Timothy, that as a son with a father, he has served me with the gospel. Him, therefore, I hope to send presently. I'm going to send him pretty quick. So soon as I know, see how it goes with me. I'm on trial, you know. And i got to find out what that court's going to say. But, verse number 24, I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly. I believe I'm going to be set free from jail, and I myself will be able to visit you. Verse 25, Yet I suppose it necessary to send unto you Epaphroditus. He's the guy that brought the money. He's the guy that got sick. And, and, and I thought it necessary to send him back to you guys. He's my brother. He's my companion in labor. He's my fellow soldier. But... He's your messenger, and he's the one that ministered to me my wants. You know, I was in need. I needed money for my, my house arrest. I needed food and shelter and clothes. Verse number 26, he longed after you all. Boy, he was worried about you guys. He was homesick. He was full of heaviness. Why was Epaphroditus so sad? Because that you, the Philippians, had heard that he had been sick. So as soon as he found out that you knew that he was sick, he knew you would be sad, and that made him sad. For indeed, verse number 27, he was sick. Oh, nigh unto death. He almost died. But God had mercy on him, not to him only, not to him only, but also on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. What does that mean? Well, if he would have died, I'd have been sad that he died, but I've also been sad that you were sad. 
And that would have broke my heart too. So when God healed Epaphroditus, he, healed, he, he just blessed me abundantly. Go to chapter 4, verse number 10. Chapter 4, verse number 10. But I rejoiced. I rejoiced. Now here he is in jail. And he's rejoicing in the Lord greatly. Why? That now at the last your care of me has flourished again. Oh, you took care of me when I was in Thessalonica. You took care of me when I was in Corinth. And now I'm in jail in Rome. And your care of me has flourished again. You've helped me again. And I'm glad. But you lacked opportunity. You, you yourself couldn't send it. You had to send it. Now, verse number 11. It's not that I speak in respect of want. It's not that I, I, I'm saying that I got to have it. No, in fact, I have learned in whatever state I'm in, therewith to be content. If I'm in jail, if I'm free, if I'm here, if I'm there, it don't matter. I've learned to be content. I know how to uh, both be abased and I know how to abound. I know how to be poor and I know how to have plenty. Everywhere in all things I am instructed both to be full and hungry, both abound and suffer need. I can do it all. He says in verse number 13, I can do all things through what? Who? Christ. Christ. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me, but notwithstanding, even though I can do it all, even in jail here, notwithstanding, you have done well. I appreciate it that you have communicated with my affliction. You've sent money while I'm in jail. I appreciate that. You've done well for doing that. Now you Philippians, verse number 15, you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, ever since I was there on my second missionary journey and baptized that Philippian jailer in Lydia, in the very beginning, what have you done? When I departed from Macedonia and I went down to Corinth and Achaia, no church communicated with me concerning giving and receiving. Not even Corinth. Nobody gave me money. Nobody helped me. Who did? But you only. You Philippians only supported me. Even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again unto my necessity. And it's not because I desire the gift, but I desire fruit that may abound on your account. I, I, you are just, I'm so thankful that y'all have blessed me. Not that I needed it, God take care of me, but, but you've done good. And it's fruit on your account. But I have all, verse number 18 of chapter 4. I have all, and I bound. I'm in good shape. I am full. How come? I've received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you. It's an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice, acceptable, well-pleasing to God. I'm in good shape, and I thank you for that gift. It's wonderful. But then... A fella came to Rome and visited with him, and his name was Onesimus. And Onesimus was a slave. He found Paul in Rome, probably knew of him, because Onesimus is from Colossae. We got a letter to the Colossians that we'll talk about in just a second. But he said, Onesimus, you're from Colossae? Yes. Yes. Well, you're a slave, aren't you, boy? Yes, I am. I'm a runaway slave. Philemon is my master. Well, you need to go back home. You need to go back to Mr. Philemon. He's a Christian. We baptized him. And Paul didn't baptize him. Paul, as far as we know, didn't even go to Colossae or Laodicea, which is next door. A guy named Epaphras did. He's the one that established those churches. But he knows Mr. Philemon. He is, he's taught with Mr. Philemon on occasion. So he said, you've got to go back home to Colossae, Onesimus. And Onesimus said, I'm not going back. If I go back, he'll kill me. A runaway slave, that's the death penalty. You can't send me back. He said, yes, I can. And I want you to go. I'm not going to force you to go. But I want you to go. And i tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to sit down and write a letter to Philemon, your master. And I'm going to ask him to take you back. And here's what I'm going to tell him. In the very first part of the letter, it's just one chapter. And in verse number four, he says, I thank my God. There he goes again. I'm so thankful making mention of you, Philemon, in always in my, I always pray for you, Mr. Philemon. Why? Because I've heard of your love. I've heard of your faith, which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. And Mr. Onesimus 
is now a Christian. He's now a saint because I baptized him. He came to Rome. I taught him the gospel. He's become a Christian. And I know you love all saints, so I know you're going to love Mr. Philemon. In Philemon, you got your Bibles. And look at Philemon, verse number 10. In verse number 10, he said, I beseech thee for my son, Onesimus, that's runaway slave, whom, Onesimus, I have begotten in my bonds. While I'm in jail here, I begot him. How so? I taught him the gospel, baptized him. He is now a Christian. And I am beseeching you, Philemon, on his behalf. Now, you're going to Colossae? You're going back to Colossae, Mr. Onesimus? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going. I'll go back to Philemon. And, and I got this letter that you wrote to Mr. Philemon. I got it in my pocket. And boy, when I see Mr. Philemon, I'm going to whoop that letter out. And I'm going to stick it out. I'm going to say, hey, this is from Paul. This is from Paul. Because otherwise, he may throw me in jail or even have me executed. I got to have this letter of recommendation. Well, I tell you what. Since you're from Colossae, and Mr. Philemon is also a member of the Colossian Church of Christ, they're in Colossae, the church that, that meets there and worships there, I want to write a letter to the Colossians. And so he does. And there's so many comparisons. If you get your Philemon and Colossians together, you'll see in all of these, uh, in Colossians and Philemon, they mention Tychicus, Onesimus, Aristarchus, Marcus, Epaphras, Lucas, Demas, Luke, you know who Luke is, uh, the writer of the Gospel of Luke, and Archippus. They're all mentioned the same. Why? Because he's at the same spot. Philemon knows the same people that he's writing to the Colossians. Why? They go to church at Colossae. There's a church planted there. And so he writes to the Colossians, Since you're going, Onesimus, you need to give this letter to the church. Give the letter to Philemon, but give this letter to the church. And by the way, I want to send with you a helper. His name is Tychicus. That's how I'm going to pronounce it. It may be Tychicus. Uh, I don't know, but it's easy for me to say Tychicus. So, Mr. Tychicus is going to go with you. And y'all going to go visit Philemon. You're going to go visit the church there at Colossae. And you're going to read this letter to them. And here's what I want to say in the Colossian letter. We give thanks. This is the very first chapter. The very first couple of verses. We give thanks. Paul's in jail. Thanking for the Philippians. Thanking for the Philemon. Thanking for Mr. the Colossian church. We give thanks to God and the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Praying. I'm praying always, always. He said that to the Philemon. Uh, he said that to the Philippians. I always pray for you. Why? We heard of your faith. We heard of that about you, Philemon. Your faith and, and, and the love which you have to all the saints. We know that Philemon loves all the saints. We know that you at Colossae, the church there, that meet there. Philemon might be a, a, one of the deacons. We don't know, but, he's, but he goes there. We know he's in the town. And he says, you're the same. Y'all love the saints just like Philemon does. Look at Colossians chapter 2, verse number 1. I want you to know something. Chapter 2, verse number 1. I would, that means I want, that you know what great conflict I have for you. I think about y'all all the time. I love you. And for them at Laodicea. For as many as have not seen my face in the flesh... Maybe Paul never been to Colossae and they have never seen Paul. Maybe Laodicea, never seen Paul. They're, they're real close together uh, in, their, in their towns. But I, I care about you people because I know that you are faithful and I know that you love the saints and that makes me happy. And I just pray for you all the time. Look at chapter 2, verse 11. In whom also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, putting on the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. How did you do that? How did you, the circumcision takes away flesh. This circumcision is circumcision made without hands. It takes away something. What does it take away? It takes away your sins. How did you do that? Look at verse number 12 of chapter 2. Buried with him in baptism. Wherein also you are risen with him through faith. It's an operation of God. It's not an operation of a man taking away flesh. It's an operation of God in your baptism where you took away your sins. Look at chapter 4, verse number 7. So all my state, chapter 4, verse number 7. Everything going on in my life, Tychicus shall declare unto you. He's a beloved brother. Skip down to verse number 9. With Onesimus, that runaway slave. 
A faithful and beloved brother. So Tychicus and Onesimus has come to visit Philemon, and he's come to visit the Colossian church. And y'all know Tychicus, y'all know Philemon, y'all know Onesimus. And I wrote this letter because I think about you. I love you, even though I'm in jail. But Tychicus, Onesimus, on your way to Colossae, there's another church there that I spent three years. Two years I was in the school of Tyrannus. And, and all of Asia Minor heard the word of God while I was in that school because boys would come to me, men, and I would teach them. And they would go everywhere. And they even took the gospel to Colossae and Laodicea and all the places around Asia Minor there, which is present-day Turkey. And in that city, I spent a lot of time. And I want to write a letter to them because it's on the way. It's just about that far on the map from this city that I'm about to tell you and, and Colossae and Laodicea. What is that city? It is the Ephesians. If you lay the Ephesians and the Colossians side by side, their letter, every one of these in the Ephesians verses and every one of these in the Colossians verses almost say the exact same thing. It's almost a replica. A few more chapters in one than the other, but it's the same message. Why? Because Paul is in Rome. He's in jail. He's thinking about the same things. It's on his mind. So he sends Tychicus and Onesimus with a letter to the Ephesians. He says, stop by there and give them this letter. And what is he going to tell them? In the very first chapter. Chapter number 1, verse number 15. Wherefore I also, I Paul, in Rome, in prison, after I heard of your faith and your love that you have to all the saints, just like Philemon, just like the Colossians, just like the Philippians, I cease not to give thanks for you. I'm so thankful for you. And I make mention of you in my prayers. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for the Philemons. I'm praying for the Ephesians. I'm praying for the Colossians. I'm praying for Mr. Philemon. Because I love you guys. And if you read the whole letter of the Ephesians, he's telling them to get right. Get right. Walk worthy of your vocation wherein you are called. Put off the things in the former life. You used to be wicked. You used to serve flesh. Put all that off and put on godly things and righteous things because there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's just one of these things. So get unified. Don't be splintered. Look at chapter 6 of, of, of Ephesians. Look at verse 21. Chapter 6, verse 21. But that you also may know my affairs. Just like I told the Colossians, I want them to know how I do. I want the Philippians to know how I do. I want Philemon to know how I do. Well, I want you to know how to do. Well, how do I, who's going to tell you? Tychicus. He's a beloved brother. He's a faithful minister in the Lord. He'll make known to you all things. Just like Tychicus is going to make the Colossians know how I'm doing. He's going to make the Ephesians know. Why? Because Tychicus took the letter along with Mr. Onesimus, the runaway slave. The whole point is, Paul loved these people. He prayed for these people, even though he was in jail. Folks, are you a Christian? Am I a Christian? He told the Colossians, it's an operation of God. That's why you're a Christian. That, that circumcision is not of the flesh, it's of the Spirit. It's made without hands. You can be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. You can rise to walk a new life. And when you do, God's going to add you to... You're not voted in. There's nobody that can tell you you are or you're not. No. God adds you to that one Lord, one, faith, one church, one body. He adds you to that. It's a spiritual thing. But you have to obey the plan. You heard the word, you believe it, you repent of your sins, you confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, you're baptized for the remission of your sins, Acts 2.38, and it's an operation of God that happens when you do that, and then you rise to, walk, to live faithfully, put off the former things, put on the new things. Walk worthy of your vocation wherein you are called. Have you been baptized for the remission of your sins? The Bible clearly says, Paul, Wanted those folks to do it, and he wrote letters. While he's in jail, he wrote letters because he loved them. He thanked God for them. 
But he also knew that if they were not walking worthy, if they were not putting on the things of God and going back to their former conversation, they'd be lost. And that's why he told them, you need to get right. We'll pray for you. Maybe you've put off the things that you should be putting on. It's time to come back. Either be baptized or let us pray for you and let God forgive you. Why don't you come? Why together we stand in sight?